Okay, so good morning. My name is Dr. Cynthia Villasis. A little, a little bit about me. It's I went to medical school in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, my my university name is Pontifical uh, Catholic University of Ecuador. So I graduated back in 2018. But we're here to hear a little bit more about temporal lobe epilepsy, fascinating topic. And we will start with. Um, a case, we're talking about the case and then we'll go from there. So this case is about a 52 year old left-handed female. She uh, has a diagnosis of temporal lobe epilepsy and she came to the clinic for a follow-up. Uh, she was previously treated with carbamazepine, but she eventually developed hyponatremia and she's currently taking Aptium. Uh, she is seizure free, thankfully, within with her, in regards to her past medical history, she has a sleep apnea, uh, gastrointestinal reflux disease, migraines, chronic disease of tonsils, adenoids, plantar fasciitis, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, encephalomalacia, and seizures since Charles, since childhood. Uh, within family history, an important thing is that her mother uh, had eclampsia and she was uh, taking phenobarbital while she was pregnant uh, with the patient. She is taking lorazepam, pantoprazole, carafid suspension, and aptium. Uh, within the physical examination, well, it's uh, re unremarkable. And her last EEG was completely normal and photic photic simulation and hyperventilation did not elicit any change. So we are continuing with uh, Aptium. Okay, just um, we're talking about some epilepsy overview. Uh, it's a chronic CNS disorder. It's defined as two minimum of two unprovoked seizures. It's the fourth most common neurological uh, disorder and 50 million people worldwide are affected. Uh, 150,000 uh, of new cases are found each year uh, within the US and 3.4 million, um, we have 3.4 million of cases also in the US. Uh, an important thing that we as clinicians and neurologists need to do is we need to identify causes of the seizures and the best way is to identify uh, them in regards, uh, depending on the age of the patient. It's a good, good way to approach this. Uh, but uh, if we're going to focus on the part of temporal lobe epilepsy, the main etiologies that have been identified, it's a history of brain injury in early life, changes in the structure of the temporal lobe and febrile seizures. But we are going to focus mainly on febrile seizures. An important thing is that uh, the patients that eventually develop uh, temporal lobe epilepsy had a history of prolonged complex febrile seizures that, that's defined a seizure of 15 minutes or more. Not all the patients that have uh, febrile seizures develop temporal lobe epilepsy, but, so, but most of the patients that uh, have temporal lobe epilepsy have this uh, history. Uh, in regards to the seizures, um, we can say that they're divided in partial focal seizures and generalized seizures. We're going to pay a close attention to the partial focal seizures that are subdivided within sim with simple partial and complex partial. Uh, we're talking simple partial we, when we have um, uh, preserve awareness and complex partial when we have um, impaired awareness. Uh, the most important um, etiology or cause of partial focal seizures is actually temporal lobe epilepsy. The International League of Epilepsy, um, sorry, the Inter International League uh, Against Epilepsy uh, has subdivided uh, the types of seizures seen in temporal lobe epilepsy as medio, medio basal and lateral neocortical, that it's um, depending on the, on the location of the seizures. Okay, so now we're going uh, towards an interesting topic that I really like, that it's um, uh, some of the history. So here we have two interesting pictures. The first one, it's a painting made by Van Gogh back in 1890. This 
painting is called Reminiscence of the North. An important thing to mention is that Van Gogh was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. And this painting um, was, he did this painting back in France when he was institutionalized in saint Remy. And he had a two month period where uh, he experienced a lot of these issues. And well, this painting came up uh, from that period of his time. An important or an interesting fact is that he drank a lot of absinthe, that is a type of decor that has epileptogenic uh, features. So it's hypothesized that diet may be maybe affected a lot or exacerbated the frequency of uh, seizures. And on the other side, we have an interesting image about a manuscript of, of one of the books of Dostoevsky called The Demons. And in this picture, we can actually see some of the features of uh, personality of these patients. That is hyperreligiosity, hypergraphia, and we have some drawings um, related to these demons. Uh, here in the next slide, we have this called interictal behavior syndrome. It's actually seen in most of the patients. The problem is that sometimes it's hard to identify. And so we have hyperreligiosity, hypergraphia, Clinginess, loss of interest in sex, and aggressiveness. Um, in clinginess, we are talking about, we can refer to Van Gogh. He had a close friend called, uh, called Paul Gauguin. And he actually was, um, Van Gogh was really close to him. And he depended, he relied on, on, on him uh, for many, many reasons. So that's a good example of clinginess. And uh, actually, the patient of our case uh, had features of hyperreligiosity and hypergraphia. Hyper she described herself as a person that likes to write a lot. So that's uh, interesting. In regards to pathophysiology, like a general view, we could say that um, the patient experiences an initial insult. There's a latent period and eventually epilepsy. Uh, when we're talking about initial insult, we can talk about brain injury, we can talk about tumors, and also the case of, um, of seizures, of febrile seizures. Uh, so we're going to focus mainly on the medial temporal lobe uh, type and location. An important thing is after this initial insult, there's an important loss of neurons made mainly pyramidal uh, cells. And this causes a loss of recurrent inhibition and irreversibly damage uh, of GABAergic interneurons. This also results in neuronal reorganization that eventually causes hyperexcitability and structural changes. And as a result, we have hypo hippocampal sclerosis. We have four types of hippocampal sclerosis. The main one is the type one, when where you can find an important neuronal loss and gliosis in CA1 and CA4 um, location of the hippocampus. So that's one important thing. And then we we'll later um, are going to see an image of that in an MRI. And in regards to the other, the counterpart, the lateral temporal lobe origin, uh, this mainly is related to underlying structural pathology. And it actually is not that, not that common. Then we have some of the clinical features that are really interesting. We have auras. Auras can be divided in visceral. Uh, visceral can be the sensation, like an unsettling sensation in the stomach. Sometimes it's called as a rising nausea. Uh, we have also the cephalic aura that the patients define like a pressure in their head. Uh, gustatory aura, they may refer as a nose taste. The olfactory aura, that it's really common, this burning smell. Um, affective aura, it depends. It can be, they can experience intense fear or they can experience some kind of ecstasy. And 
one of the most common um, experiences they have is this deja vu feeling. It's really commonly described within the patients. Um, we can also say that initially the patient experienced this partial awareness and this is seen in the early stages of the seizure. Eventually they lose awareness and they, and an important feature is this motionless stare. We can also uh, see, see um, automatisms, mainly oral, oral alimentary, this lip smacking, um, um, this lip smacking uh, characteristic. It's not that intense, it's not that, that evident uh, like in the case of frontal lobe seizures. We also have uh, gestural automatisms such as fidgeting. And there's also behavioral automatisms. Maybe we can see patients uh, running, walking, or even undressing. Uh, we have also post-ictal confusion and headache that is really common due to loss of awareness, if we have loss of awareness. And an interesting feature is we have dysphagia and uh, nose driving. This is really useful in lateralizing and maybe trying to identify the, where the lesion, lesion is located. Uh, when we see this patient in a patient, we, can, um, we are talking about a lesion on speech dominant side and this nose rubbing, it's also important to lateralize it to the ipsilateral side where the, where the seizure is starting. Also, we have uh, memory, memory loss, mainly related to uh, recent events. Uh, with the diagnosis, we have um, a, within, well, the important thing is bilateral or bilateral temporal spikes on EE. We also have hypometabolism of, on interictal PET or hypoperfusion on interictal spect. Uh, these are the, the last two are really important or really useful for uh, localization of the lesions. And with uh, an important thing in the MRI, the MRI findings is the hippocampal sclerosis. In the image seen, we can um, actually um, maybe see it identified in the right side. There's an increase of the signal intensity. This is a T2 waiting um, image. And we can also uh, see uh, a small temporal lobe, a smaller temporal lobe. Um, when we are talking about the treatment, uh, we have pharmacologic treatment. We have a uh, vagal nerve stimulation treatment that was uh, actually approved by the FDA in 1997 and the temporal lobectomy that of course is the, um, the, the permanent, permanent treatment. Uh, with the pharmacologic treatment, the um, commonly used um, pharma, commonly used um, drug is carbamazepine, but the thing is the multiple um, side effects, uh, just like the case with our patient that developed eventually hyponatremia, so that's really important. There's also a common combination of levetiracetam and lamotrigine. And we have an interesting option that is Tesla carbazepine. That's uh, the aptium I was referring. Uh, the benefit of this drug, it's um, really, um, really, um, Close. It has some of the properties of carbamazepine or exazepine, but the the side effect profile it's much better uh, compared to these other drugs. It actually uh, has shown um, really good and promising uh, results when it's used uh, either as a monotherapy or when it's started like at the beginning of the treatment, or also if it's started when the patient is only uh, using one type of anti-epileptic ep drug. Uh, and finally, uh, with the prognosis, um, when we have a patient that has intractable seizures, um, the patients eventually experience memory and mood problems. They have a lower quality of life and there's an increased risk of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. 
And when we are talking about changes in on MRI, this is actually uh, useful to predict that the patient uh, has a decreased chance of seizure freedom. And in the last part, we have um, this is part of um, a, par a paragraph taken for, from the idiot um, book of Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky actually um, had ma many of his characters, actually maybe four out of, out of his 12 novels, he had these characters that were epileptic characters and they described some of uh, their experiences. This one uh, is, this character is Prince Mishkin, and he's talking about what he feels during his epilepsy. So he says, he was, say, he was thinking incidentally that there was a moment or two in his epileptic condition almost before the fit itself, if it occurred in waking hours, when suddenly amid the sadness, spiritual darkness and depression, his brain seemed to catch fire at brief moments. His sensation of being alive and his, uh, his awareness increased tenfold at those moments which flashed by like lightning. His mind and heart were flooded by a dazzling light. All his agitation, doubts, and worries seemed composed in a twinkling, culminating in a great calm, full of understanding. But these moments, these glimmerings, were still but a premonition of that final second, never more than a second with which the seizures began itself. That second was, of course, unbearable. Uh, so that's, that's my presentation and thank you so much.